Welcome. Welcome to today's webinar, Wound Staging, A Practical Guide. I'm Deborah Kurtz and I'm your moderator today and let's begin our webinar. There's a few bookkeeping items that I need to go over with you before we turn the webinar over to today's speaker. But for starters, everybody is muted as a participant. So if you're listening, um, if you're listening in, know that we can't hear you, but there's mechanisms in place for you to uh, provide questions to us. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar today. And if you want to submit your question in advance, you can do so using the dashboard setting of GoToMeetings that's on your right-hand side of your screen. Also, and very importantly, today's webinar is available for 1.0 continuing education units through the California Board of Nursing for Nurses. So um, to all registered attendees, you'll be see receiving an email from Wound Rounds, our sponsor today. And this email will contain information for you on how to go about getting your um, CEUs and also how to get your certificate of completion for today's webinar. So check your email for this following today's webinar. Webinar. And also note in that webinar, in that email, you'll be receiving a PDF of today's deck. So everybody will be getting handouts from today's webinar, um, and that will be made available to you shortly after we finish up today. Um, a word to you who might be listening to this in archived format, because yes, indeed, we are recording today's webinar. It will be made available on the Wound Rounds website after today's session. So uh, for folks who are viewing this after February 23rd, I do want to make note that CEUs are not available for those participants. So um, with those bookkeeping items having been said, what I'd like to do is begin today's webinar um, first with a, a few matter of introductions. Um, I'll be introducing to you shortly Anne Schurig, who is our speaker today. Anne is very accomplished in the area of wound care. For starters, she is on staff with Wound Rounds, which is the sponsor of today's webinar. And additionally to that, Anne brings to us um, a long history of leadership in the wound care nursing industry. Most particularly, Anne has served as the past president of the local affiliate for the Wound Ostomy Continence Nursing Association, and also as the former editor of the WCN newsletter. So we're very thankful to have Anne with us today. And um, information about how to contact Anne, including her email address and phone number, are at the end of today's webinar. So if you'd like to ask questions of Anne outside of today's engagement, you'll have that opportunity to get her information. And a quick word about myself. I'm your moderator today, and um, I bring to, the, uh, bring to this webinar um, some background in the wound care industry as I work with various wound care companies and helping them to commercialize products. So with that having been said, let's turn this webinar over to Anne and begin with today's session. So a big thank you to Anne for joining us today. Anne Schurig. Thank you, Deb. Today we're going to address the issue of pressure ulcers and how to stage them appropriately. To meet our CE objectives, we're going to start uh, by reading through the objectives very quickly. We're going to define the term of pressure ulcer. We're going to understand where we get these resources from these definitions through the NPUAP and the WOCN. We're going to address the three mechanical forces other than pressure that might contribute to pressure ulcer development identify the key characteristics of each stage of pressure ulcer. We're also going to talk about deep tissue injury, the rationale why we don't reverse stage, and we're going to talk about two tissue types that might be found in an unstageable pressure ulcer. Let's start by talking about the skin itself. You know, the skin is the largest organ in our body, and we forget that it's an organ. We need to treat it as such. It can weigh up to six to eight pounds um, of our total body weight and have a surface area of up to 20 feet. The skin also receives a third of our cardiac output. 
so it can really take up a lot of our resources. Its primary function is as a, that of protection, and this is accomplished by acting as a buffer against trauma. This is possible because the skin's inherent elasticity provides such a great protection for us. Skin's regeneration is remarkable. It can, um, over the course of a person's lifetime, it can produce over 3 million pounds of skin cells and will turn over 98% of the skin cells in a person's body in a year's time. The skin has two, barri two major barrier functions. One, it reduces water loss. I'm sorry, folks, we're getting some feedback. Let's take a pause for a minute. Sorry as we're having some mechanical difficulties, we're going to mute out that background noise and continue in today's webinar, so please bear with us. All right, All right, we're back. Let's talk, Let's talk about the functions of the skin. The primary function of the skin is protection, and it acts as a two-way barrier. It helps reduce the loss of water to the environment as well as protect from microorganisms or contaminants entering the body. It helps with temperature regulation. It helps with fluid and electrolyte balance, metabolism. Of course, it provides sensation and synthesis to us, and it helps us communicate. What kind, of what kind of mechanical forces, forces contribute, contribute to pressure, to pressure ulcer? ulcer? Well, of course, well, of pressure, course pressure. That's, right, that's in right in the name. There's also, There's friction, also friction, shearing, shearing and, maceration. and maceration. Friction, friction is, the is the rubbing of the two forces, forces together. Shearing, shearing is when the skin slides over a bony prominence, a bony prominence and deteriorates, and deteriorates the, skin's the skin's protective layers from underneath. From underneath. Maceration, maceration is the overhydration of the skin. skin. Think of what, Think your, of what your fingertips look like, look like when you've been in soapy water, water for a while and they get soft, soft and white and mushy. And mushy. That's, maceration. That's maceration. The NPUAP, the NPUAP which is the National Pressure, pressure, pressure Ulcer, Ulcer Advisory, advisory Panel, has become, has become an, an internationally recognized, recognized entity. And, and collaborating, collaborating with professionals, professionals corporations, corporations, and government agencies, agencies they've become, they've become a model, a model for, addressing for addressing major health care issues. In 2007, they partnered with the EPUAP, the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, and created uh, ultimate staging definitions for us. They defined or redefined the term pressure ulcer. They updated the stages of pressure ulcers, and they added two new sorely needed categories, that of deep tissue injury and the unstageable pressure ulcer. You can see and read the definitions in two different resources that are provided out in the community now. There's the NPUAP Pressure Ulcer Prevention and Treatment Guidelines, and there's the Guidelines for Pressure prevention and management of pressure ulcers from the WOCN. WOCN provided this guideline in 2010 following the release of the NPUAP document. So what does WOCN say a pressure ulcer is? Their definition is an area of localized tissue discretion caused by compression of the soft tissue over a bony prominence 
combined with an external surf or an external surface for a prolonged period of time. NPUAP says that the localized injury to the skin or underlying tissue can be over a bony prominence and is the result of pressure or pressure in combination with shear and friction. So they add in those friction and shear uh, capabilities that we know contribute to pressure ulcer formation. And we not need to be ever cognizant of those because it's not just the immobile patient, but the forces that are in that patient's immobile environment. So friction and shear happen in moving patients or not moving patients appropriately. So currently we define these wounds as pressure ulcers and that's the most appropriate documentation we should use. Previously they were called decubitus ulcer or bed sore or pressure sores and we need to update our documentation to reflect the current terminology. And PUAP references external forces that can contribute to pressure ulcer development. Well, what are those external forces that are uh, in contribution? Well, there's mattresses, wheelchairs, even things like side rails and splints. That's right. That's right. Um, orthotic devices like AFOs or ill-fitting shoes, even pillows that aren't placed correctly or are not repositioned in a timely manner can cause a pressure ulcer. Who is at risk? Well, certainly our impaired or our decreased mobile patients, anybody with decreased functionality that can't sense or change position easily. Uh, comorbidities contribute, things like cardiac disease, respiratory disease, kidney disease, anything that impairs the hemodynamic stability of a patient will contribute to their risk factors. Certainly drugs that do the same and impaired or localized blood flow um, like in the diabetic patient or the patient with peripheral vascular disease will put that patient at higher risk. Don't neglect your patients with cognitive impairment. Oftentimes they forget or can't track time elapse and so they don't move in a timely manner. Our patients and residents who are exposed to urinary and fecal incontinence, certainly that compromises the integrity of the skin by compromising the pH of the skin. Malnutrition is a huge contributor to pressure ulcer formation. Again, the skin is an organ of the body. If we don't keep it nourished and hydrated, that organ is going to fail. Clients who refuse some aspects of care, such as repositioning, taking nutritional supplements, or uh, letting us know when they have been incontinent, all of those contribute. And certainly if they have a history of previous pressure ulcers, that's going to contribute to their risk as well because once that skin heals over that area, it's up to 10% less resilient than it was when it was undamaged. Unavoidable pressure ulcers, it's the big buzzword what's avoidable and what's unavoidable in our community. Here's the definition. An unavoidable pressure ulcer means that a resident developed a pressure ulcer even though the facility had evaluated the resident's clinical condition and their pressure oh. ulcer risk factors and have implemented interventions that are consistent with the resident's needs, goals, and the recognized standards of practice. They monitored and evaluated the impact of interventions and revised the approach approaches as appropriate. There's a tongue twister for you. Basically what it says is did you do everything that you needed to do and did you document it? And that's where most patient, most facilities fall down is in the documentation of were the interventions put in place and did the patient or resident allow those interventions to be administered to them? Document, document, document. Let's talk about deep tissue injury as the first pressure ulcer stage that we're going to define today. This is a newer category for us and it's one that we've sorely needed for years. We've often seen those ulcers that develop as uh, purple and mushy and nasty and we know that they're just going to get worse and there was nothing we could do about it previously in our documentation. Now we have the support of the NPUAP to help us define what that DTI is. A suspected deep tissue injury is purple or maroon, it's localized, it, 
discoloration, it could be a blood-filled blister, and it's often due to the damage of the underlying tissue from pressure, shear, or friction. It could be firm or mushy. It could be boggy. It could be warmer or cooler. The, the idea is you need to feel the tissue and feel what's going on in that wound bed. Deep tissue injuries can be hard to detect in patients with darker skin tones because colors become muted. So, Anne, this is Deborah breaking in. So I've noticed there's some question about whether or not people of darker skin tones can actually have DTIs. Is, is that true, or is it just merely that they're harder to detect in people with darker skin tones? That's a great question. And they generally are harder to detect because we can't see that slight variation in color. And that's why you really need to use your assessment skills, not only visually, but with your hands and with the knowledge that you have of what constitutes a DTI. We expect that DTIs are going to get worse over time. The whole idea is that the damage has happened from the inside and is slowly revealing itself to the outside. So what may start out as a thin blister, over a wound bed can become an eschar covered area. Also, a blister or a purple mushy area can explode and open and be a deep crater underneath. The important thing to know is that we expect that it's going to evolve and that <clears throat> that doesn't count against you in your documentation when a DTI advances to a more stageable wound. Here's a picture diagram of the skin, and in this diagram we see down here's the bony area, here's the blood flow against that bone, then we have the subcutaneous fat and the dermis and epidermis. The pressure is coming from the inside and killing off the tissue as it moves to the surface. So this damage has long been done before we see any kind of damage revealed up on the surface area. That's why we call it a deep tissue injury. Here's some examples of DTIs. The photo on the left is a patient who fell at home and was left for a long period of time lying without relief. So you can see the large purple areas, and in, in some of those areas are covered in eschar. Right here but we have this large purple area which we know is more than just a bruise and that whole area is likely to break down and become an ulcer as it progresses. Additionally over here we have a heel. How many of you have seen heels like this? We see these a lot on our hip and knee replacement patients that come to us from acute care sometimes um, and they come in with these purpley heels, not necessarily a blister, but um, a separation of the dermis and epidermis nonetheless, and we see this mushy, purpley area. If you touch that, it would be like a soft sponge, and that's a DTI. I have a question that came in that said, all, are all blood blisters considered DTIs? The question is, according to MDS and long-term care, yes, if you have a blood blister, it's a DTI, but you have to look at the etiology of that wound. Is that wound caused by pressure, friction, or shearing? If it was, then yes, it's a DTI. If it was caused by trauma to the area and not necessarily over a bony prominence, then that blood blister isn't necessarily a DTI. Stage one, what constitutes a stage one? Well, the definition says that it's intact skin with non-blanchable redness in a localized area. And in a darkly pigmented resident or patient, we can't see that color difference, so we may have to look for other changes in the skin, such as change of temperature, change in turgor, so is it mushy or boggy as well. The key parameters in this definition are one, intact skin, and two, non-blanchable. One of the most frustrating things is to read a chart that says, patient has a stage one with minimal drainage. Well, if it's draining, folks, it's not intact skin, and therefore it can't be a stage one. 
what constitutes blanchable and non-blanchable. Think of a bad sunburn, and when you push on the redness of that sunburn, it turns white underneath your thumb, and you can see that whiteness, and then it resolves back into redness. That's blanching. If the skin blanches when you push on that redness, if your white thumbprint appears, that's blanchable skin, and then that doesn't constitute a stage one. Only if it stays red when you push on it does it constitute a stage one. Stage one's not always the heralding sign of tissue damage as we've seen with a DTI. The area can be painful, it can be a change in tissue type. Sometimes even patients complain of itching. This always is an indication of an at-risk person and it's one of the first signs that that patient is at risk. Here's our diagram again showing us a stage one and again we have the bone, we have the blood flow and the subcutaneous tissue and what we're seeing is that we don't have a lot of damage down in the subcutaneous areas but we do have a lot of damage up here, some redness and irritation to the skin. This can be caused by that friction and shearing or it can be caused by pressure. Pay attention to that early redness. Here's some examples of stage ones. The picture on the right, that's a nice pretty stage one, right? That's the one we all want to see because it's very evident to us. The picture on the left, boy, that's a tricky one. In this clinician that shared this photo says that this is a stage one and based on the skin color and the turgor of the rest of the foot, you can see up here the purple discoloration. That could be just redness for that patient. However, because it's got some purple undertones, I'd want to feel this and see if it's boggy or mushy, and that might even be a DTI. So you can't rely just on your eyes, you have to use all of your assessment skills. Stage two. Stage two, now we've got some skin loss, right? It's a partial thickness loss of the dermis, it's a shallow open ulcer, it has a red, a pink or a pale pink wound bed, but no slough, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It may present as an intact blister, open or not. If it's a serum-filled blister, that means we've had a separation of the epidermis and the dermis, and therefore qualifies as a stage two. Stage two ulcers present as shiny, shallow ulcers. There's no slough in them, and there's no bruising. If there's bruising in a stage two, it constitutes a DTI. It should not be described as a stage two if it's a skin tear, a tape burn, or a dermatitis. Those are their own categories. So Anne, um, this is Deborah with a question for you. So if you have a patient presenting with a skin tear, a tape, a skin tear, a tape burn, a perineal dermatitis, or maceration, excoriation, how would you characterize that and chart that for that patient? All of those uh, wound types fall under the category of a trauma to the skin, with the exception of the dermatitis. Perineal dermatitis, if it's due to incontinence, is its own category, incontinence-associated dermatitis, or IAD. We're going to address that at the end of the presentation. The others are traumas to the skin and should be documented as such, but they're not necessarily related to pressure. Here's our... Here's our diagram again, our stage two. This is where we've advanced from just redness on the dermis into um, the subcut or just above the subcutaneous layer, and we've got a shallow crater there. Now be careful with stage twos. Don't look at them just by the physical depth of the wound. A stage two has to do with what tissue is or is not present in that wound bed. So if there's no dermis and epidermis, and we haven't gone into the subcutaneous tissue yet, then it's a stage two. Here's some nice stage two pictures. On the left, we see that it's over a bony prominence. Looks like the spine there to me. And we can see we've put some protective. You can see the shadow of a little zinc-based uh, product around the edges there with the white and here's our shallow crater in the center. Here in the right-sided picture, we can see that the skin has just barely denuded, and we can see the dermis under the epidermis exposed here in this area. 
Let's talk about stage three now. This is a full thickness tissue loss. We're down into the subcutaneous layer, and there's no visible bone or muscle yet, but we have gone way below the dermis. This is where slough can develop in that subcutaneous layer. So if there's slough present in a wound, even though it may be a shallow crater, it automatically goes not as a stage two, but as a stage three in your documentation. Oftentimes now, because we're into the subcutaneous layer, we'll see presence of undermining or tunneling in the wound bed and need to document that as well. Again, we're talking about what tissue layers are and are not present in that wound bed. So don't go by the physical depth of the wound. A stage three over an area such as the bridge of the nose or the outer ear or the outer ankle, the malleolus, where there's not a lot of subcutaneous tissue in the first place can still be a stage three even though it's a couple millimeters thick. So, Anne, a question for you. <clears throat> Some people have asked, is a stage three always deeper than a stage two? That's a good question. It's going to depend on where it's located on the body. You could have a stage three over uh, an ankle that's two or three millimeters thick, and you could have a stage two over the coccyx that's three or four millimeters thick if there's a lot of subcutaneous tissue there. So it's important not to just go by physical measurements. In contrast to that, a stage three in a, our obese patients where there's a lot of adipose tissue can be very, very deep. So even though it's very, very deep, if there's no bony or mechanical prominences um, exposed in the wound bed, it's still only a stage three. We don't see those bone and tendon and mechanical forces or mechanical pieces exposed until we get into stage four. So let's look at that diagram again, stage three. So we're back to our bone and our blood flow, and now we're down into that subcutaneous layer, and we're exposing that subcutaneous layer, and that's what constitutes your stage three pressure ulcer. So here's some nice pictures of stage threes. On the left, we can see this is pretty obvious, right? We've got a lot of depth to this wound. We can see that we're into the subcutaneous layer, and we can see how much adipose tissue is present on this patient regularly, so we know we're down into that subcutaneous layer. However, this picture on the right, oops, lost my photo, sorry, folks. That picture on the right is a little trickier. Because it's on a heel and we don't have a lot of adipose tissue, that wound looks fairly shallow on the surface, but that shallow wound still is a stage three because there wasn't a lot of subcutaneous tissue there to begin with. So make sure you're looking at your tissue types, not just at your measurements. And then there's stage four. These are pretty obvious and easy to identify, right? It's a full thickness tissue loss. We have exposed bone, tendon, or muscle. There may be slough or eschar in the pres in the present in the wound bed because of the depth of the wound bed and the amount of tissue damage that's done. There's often undermining and tunneling present as well. Uh, stage fours can vary by anatomical location as well, so pay attention to those tissue types. When they extend into the muscle or the supporting structures, oftentimes we're exposing the patient to osteomyelitis. As soon as that bone gets exposed, uh, and is exposed for a prolonged period of time because it does not have those protected layers of the skin to keep the bacteria out, osteomyelitis can set in fairly readily. Their literature supports that up to 60% of stage four pressure ulcers have osteo in them. So if you have a non-healing stage four ulcer, you might want to have that patient evaluated for osteomyelitis. Make sure that you use all of your assessment skills as well, because sometimes you can't see those structures but only palpate them. Here we are back to our handy-dandy diagram, and we've extended all the way down and exposed the bone, the tendon, the supporting structures below the skin tissue layers. So our picture on the left here shows that we've got exposed tendon up here in this wound bed, and that's pretty obviously a stage four because we can see visually those structures. But this picture on the right here is a deep wound. It's fairly clean and pink. And how do we decide if this is a three or a four? 
get your hand in there and palpate because likely what made this was a, sta a stage four was that we could palpate the coccyx bone in the base of this wound and therefore it makes it a stage four. What makes a wound unstageable? Well, an unstageable wound is developed when there's full tissue, full thickness tissue loss at the base of the ulcer, but it's covered by slough, which can be yellow or tan or gray or green, or it can be covered by eschar, which is tan or brown and black, and it covers the entire wound bed. Until enough of that slough or eschar is removed and we can truly see the base of the wound, we have to call it unstageable. So Anne, a question has come in. So if you see a patient's chart and you see some wound measurements and then you see that it's being classified as an unstageable pressure ulcer, what would you make of such a chart entry? Well, I'd have to look at the whole history of the wound and I'd have to look at the etiology of the wound. But an unstageable wound doesn't develop overnight. An unstageable wound is a wound that has had prolonged pressure or prolonged damage to the skin, and the body has built up its own defense system against the outside forces and has condensed all that dead tissue and created a cap on that wound to help protect the body. That's what eschar is. Now, when we have eschar and we can feel that there's a cavity behind it, when you push on that slough or you push on that eschar and you can feel that there's a void behind it, that means we've got deeper tissue injury behind it and we have to call that wound unstageable. However, if that eschar is dry, if it's on a foot, on a heel on a foot, it's dry, it's intact, the foot wound is not draining at all, then we leave that eschar alone. That's the body's protection saying, I don't have enough resources to heal this wound. If you remove that eschar from a heal wound prematurely, you're never going to heal that wound up because there's not enough blood flow, there's not good hemodynamics, there's not good um, blood glucose control. Whatever the lacking resource is, there's not enough nutrition in the body. For some reason, the body says, I can't heal this yet. If you stabilize those factors, if you restore blood flow to the extremity, and then the eschar starts becoming mushy, it starts loosening from the edges, you start getting some drainage from around the sides of that eschar, then the body says, okay, I might have a chance at healing this. Then you want to go ahead and debride that heal. But as long as it's black, hard, attached, and non-draining on the heel, you want to leave it alone. Here we can see in our handy-dandy diagram that the destruction and the comp compression of the dead tissue extends all the way down through the wound bed, and therefore we have to call this wound unstageable at the moment. Here are some examples of unstageable wounds, and we have two extremes. On the left, we see this black eschar-covered wound, and we can tell clearly that that's unstageable, right, because we have deep, deep black eschar. We also have a very red, irritated, and inflamed peri-wound margin. This is a heralding sign of infection, and we want to make sure that we're addressing that aggressively in conjunction with getting this wound debrided so that we can remove as much bacteria from that wound bed as possible and move this patient towards healing. <clears throat> the flip side of that is this ulcer here that's covered in a little bit of eschar, but mostly slough, and here we see a little peak of granulation tissue underneath. So do we call this unstageable or not? Well, I'd have to feel this wound here and see, but likely underneath all that slough is another cavity that I can't visualize, but I can palpate the mushiness underneath it. Until I can remove that slough and see, does this extend down into the base and so far that I can see those supporting structures of tendon, bone, or muscle, or whether it just goes into the subcutaneous layer and therefore it's a stage three. I can't appropriately stage this wound. Now if I can get that flat back a little bit more, um, with some enzymatic debridement or hydrogel debridement, then perhaps we can go ahead and stage that wound. But until that happens, I need to leave it as an unstageable wound. 
The last thing I want to talk about briefly is incontinence-associated dermatitis. IAD is a newer category that's been provided to us, and it's defined as an inflammation of the skin that occurs when urine and or stool comes in contact with the perineal or the perigenital area. How do we determine IAD versus a pressure ulcer? Well, here's a great side-by-side -side chart. Um, the etiology of IAD is strictly from the exposure of urine and stool, whereas a pressure ulcer is over a bony prominence and likely caused by unrelieved pressure, friction, or shear. IAD generally develops in the skin folds and is rather diffuse. You can't see the edges real clearly. It's kind of spread over a large area. They're both partial thickness skin loss, but IAD never becomes necrotic, where a pressure ulcer may. And they both cause pain and itching, and so you want to be careful, make sure the patients aren't scratching, but you also want to um, make sure that you're addressing, cleansing the skin carefully so that you make sure that you can address those pain and itching, itching issues for your patients. Here's some examples of IAD. Clearly, on the left here, we see this defined area of where the patient was sitting in a pool of something that caused the skin to deteriorate. And here on the right, we have this very large area. This looks fungal to me on the outside. And here we have skin breakdown solely from sitting in a pool of urine or stool. Let's talk about reverse staging. This was a problem and a challenge for many of us in the long-term care arena because for many years we had to clinically stage and then we had to reverse stage for our documentation for reimbursement. Thankfully in 2010 when MDS 3.0 was released to long-term care reimbursement standards, we no longer reverse stage, but here's the rationale for why we never want to reverse stage. Pressure ulcers heal progressively. They go from very deep to a more shallow depth, but they never replace the muscle, the subcutaneous tissue, or the dermis that was lost in the course of that wound. They, they fill in with granulation tissue, which is basically scar tissue, and then they re-epithelialize. And since the staging system is based on what tissues are or are not present in the wound bed, we never backstage. So when a wound that starts out as a stage three fills in and becomes more shallow and starts to progress to the surface, we don't reverse it from a three to a two to a one. We call it a healing stage three or a healed stage three, and that allows us to more accurately describe and document what's going on in the wound bed. So I hope that my summary of staging definitions was helpful to you. I hope that the diagrams brought some light to what was going on with the tissue in the wound bed and that this was beneficial to you all. And I think Deb has some questions for us from the audience. All right. And thank you so much. That was a great discussion. And I don't know about the audience, but probably for me that was the best description between blanchable and non-blanchable that I've ever heard. So big thanks uh, from all of us to you, Anne, for taking the time out to explain uh, in very great detail today all these different stages of pressure ulcers. Um, what I'd like to do next is to run briefly through some resources that are available to you, including um, the next webinar in the series from Wound Rounds. And then we will turn this session over to Anne for questions and answers. And we know that many questions have already poured in. So there is a bibliography that's contained here, which will be sent to everyone um, as part of the follow-up email from Wound Rounds. You'll be receiving a copy of today's deck in addition to your information about how to get C you information. So these references will be available to you. You can see there's two pages of references to you for available for more information. And there's also some great wound and skin care resources that are available online. And so we've just listed a few of them here for you below. And again, you get this on the copy of the handout, which will be sent to you.
But we do owe a big round of thanks to Wound Rounds, who is the sponsor of today's webinar. And Wound Rounds brought this information available to you and sponsored Anne's participation today. And Wound Rounds is the point of care wound documentation tool used for wound management, and it's a prevention solution that empowers nurses to deliver better wound care in less time. And there will be a peer reviewed article about Wound Rounds that's appearing in the March issue of Ostomy Wound Management. So be sure to check that publication for more information from wound rounds. What we'd like to do now at this time is to turn this over to Ann Schurig and answer some questions that have been coming in. And I do notice that um, several questions have come in. And um, one that has uh, been asked by one participant is about the difference between maceration and excoriation. So let's turn that over to Ann. So maceration and excoriation, basically if you think of them as intact skin and non-intact skin. Macerated skin is white, boggy, um, mushy, but it's still intact. Excoriation is when the epidermis has been removed and you've got exposed dermis underneath it. Both of them are caused by too much moisture, whether that's incontinence or involuntary stool, or whether it's wound drainage itself that's not being well managed or a dressing that's not being changed in a timely manner. They're moisture driven, but one is closed skin and the other is open skin. Oh, another question that just got hand, handed to me is a great one. And the question is, if the entire DTI turned into eschar, would I stage it as unstageable? Um, if I was sure that it was all eschar, then yes, I would probably make it unstageable until I could remove that eschar and see what was underneath. And if a DTI, DTI opens to a partial thickness wound, would I stage it as a stage two? Yes, I would. Once that DTI opens up and I can see what tissue layers are involved, I would go ahead and stage it. So we expect that a DTI is going to progress into something else. Very rarely does a DTI stay as a DTI for the entire length of the wound itself. We expect that it's going to progress. Another question, what is the difference between shearing and a stage two? Shearing is the force that causes pressure ulcers. Shearing is the skin sliding back and forth. I want everybody to put their hand on the back of their other hand and move their skin back and forth over their, all, all, uh, their knuckles and see how the skin rubs back and forth over the knuckle. That's shearing. When that happens on a coccyx, on a heel, any place where there's loose tissue, that's the mechanical force that's eroding the underlying tissue structures and is going to eventually end up being an ulcer for you. So that's what shearing is. A stage two is when that shearing re results in an open wound that has eroded the epidermis and the dermis. Another question that's just come in, when you start to see a yellow area, how do you differentiate between yellow slough and adipose tissue? Boy, that's a tough one, and it really depends on where that wound is located physically and whether there was a lot of adipose tissue there to begin with. You have to really look at the wound and the tissues involved. In our obese patients, it can be challenging to identify what is adipose tissue and what is slough. Slough tends to be um, firmly adherent to the wound bed. It can, um, you can pick it up sometimes if it's stringy slough, you can pick it up, but it attaches itself to the wound bed and so you can't just wipe it off with a 4x4. Adipose tissue um, doesn't move around as much and is less um, tactile, <laughs> more of attached to the wound bed um, as part of the structure. That's a real visual thing and hard to identify just by touching. Another question, because we are not supposed to reverse stage, after unstageables are debrided, do we just note unstageable wound debrided now presents as a stage three pressure ulcer? Um, yes, that's one way to document it. Like I said at the beginning, we expect that an unstageable ulcer is going to progress into something else. So the fact that it's going from 
uh, a DTI or an unstageable to an open wound is not reverse staging. It's actually the natural progression. Just like we sometimes, unfortunately, see a 2 progress into a 3 or a 3 progress into a 4, we expect that an unstageable is going to, by definition, be staged once we debride it, and that we expect that a DTI is going to progress into something else because of the nature of the deep tissue that was part of the injury and in the definition of the, the term right there. I have, I have a question about, about terminal Kennedy ulcers or Kennedy terminal ulcers. Um, this is a complex question that I don't know that we really have time to go into today. But briefly, when you think of the skin as an organ and the organ failing, whether that's due to the patient's overall status or whether it's due to neglect or damage to the skin, that's where a Kennedy ulcer comes in. A Kennedy terminal ulcer is an ulcer that develops in a patient who is starting into the dying process and they're, t they're experiencing tissue failure or organ failure of their skin. That's just scratching the surface on Kennedy ulcers, but that's basically what it is. I encourage you to read up more on them. Um, Susan Kennedy wrote some great papers on that topic. So an interesting question has come in um, regarding how wound care is sometimes perceived as a is a team sport. So um, one person wrote in and said they have an exceptional wound care team within their facility. However, there's a huge disconnect between the care team and the bedside nursing team to make sure that wound care and management are carried out consistently. So the question from the audience is, is there any ideas from Anne on how one might bridge this gap within a team? Oh boy, that's a tough one as well, but that's a great idea. Skin care is everyone's issue. It's all of our issues as caregivers to these patients and these residents. So whether we have a dedicated skin team or not, it should be a team sport for every employee who touches that patient in that building. Maybe their responsibility is just to report what they see and follow through on the care that's then instructed to them by the physicians and the, and the wound team. Maybe their responsibilities extend to providing that care themselves. Either way, everybody needs to be ever vigilant about that skin care on that resident and that patient that they're caring for and be part of the communication and part of the action and follow through to deliver great care to our patients and our residents. So one last call for questions. Any more questions uh, for Ann Schurig today? I've got one, I've got last, one question. last question that just popped in. If a resident has tunneling or undermining, does it automatically qualify as a stage three? I don't know that the literature would support that it automatically qualifies as a stage three, but going back to our tissue involvement and looking at what in, is involved in a stage three pressure ulcer, it extends into the subcutaneous tissue and we now have have already had damage to the epidermis and the dermis, and now we have damage to the subcutaneous tissue. So if we have that type of damage, it's likely if you have undermining or tunneling that you're already into those layers, and yes, it would be a stage three or a stage four. I think that's it for questions at the moment. I thank you all for your participation today, and I look forward to hearing back from any of you in the future. So a few bookkeeping questions before we wrap up today. Wanted to share with you what's coming up next. For those of you who are interested in getting continuing education units, here's the process. You will be receiving an email from Wound Rounds, the sponsor of today's webinar, which gives you instructions on what you need to do to get your CEUs. That email will come with a copy of today's handout, a copy of today's deck. And that email will also contain links to two different tests that you need to complete. The first is a post test, and it has several questions related to the content in today's presentation. And in that post test, you need to get six out of seven questions correct in order to be eligible for CEUs. Secondly, you need to complete an evaluation of today's webinar. That is also in a link that is, is sent to you via this email. So those two links, you need to click on and take these surveys.
You need to finish those surveys in an online environment within one week from today. So the deadline for you completing those two evaluations is March 1st, 2012. At that point in time, all of the online um, surveys and, and uh, course evaluations are go directly to the continuing education unit provider. So that is the deadline for getting CEUs. For those of you who might be listening in on an archive basis, if you did not participate in this webinar on February 23rd, I'm very sorry, but you are not eligible for continuing education units. However, there is another webinar coming up that's being sponsored from Wound Rounds. This is Wound Assessment and Documentation, which is actually the next step after wound staging. And we will be delivering this webinar on April 18th. And again, it will be held at 12 noon Central Standard Time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern Time and 10 a.m. on Pacific Time. So just a note about the next up in the Wound Rounds webinar series. So um, if you're if you've um, participated in the Wound Rounds webinar today and were a registered participant, uh, you will automatically get emails about this next webinar. If you'd like to join and uh, be get emails from Wound Rounds and um, be able to participate in future webinars, please contact us on our website at woundrounds.com. So again, a big thanks to Wound Rounds for sponsoring us today and to Ann Schurig for doing an excellent job in not only presenting this material but really making it come to life. So Ann, thank you so much for your um, expert guidance today and we will look forward to the next uh, Wound Rounds webinar on April 18th. This is Deborah Kurtz signing off today, thanking everyone for their participation. Thank you. <laughs>